Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Kasia Wojcik from European Alternatives Berlin speaking. I'm very happy that you are joining us today. It probably will happen that some people will join us um, during the talk, as this is an um, afternoon event. And uh, we had a fluctuation of already 40 people crossing in or 30 people crossing in and out of the room interested in the question of voting rights beyond borders, especially for migrants. And um, I just briefly want to um, share with you what happened today. We had an amazing keynote speech by Daniel Guterres um, from Deutsche Wohnen and Eignen on the Berlin case and what it meant, means for us, uh, also for voting rights for migrants. Um, then we had an, a very interesting skill sharing session on work um, on voting rights campaigns for migrants. And uh, what we could do is to see um, it's all connected. So we had Sanas Azimipur speaking about a new campaign, a national campaign, Nicht ohne uns 14 Prozent. Then we had um, Clemens Hauser speaking about um, the Freiburg campaign, but also a national campaign in Germany for voting votes, uh, voting rights for migrants in Germany. And then we had a very special guest from Great Britain, um, Lara, who introduced us to the British case for voting rights for migrants. And um, I just want to share my one impression before I give over the word to Ophelie, who will host this moderation or this conversation. Um, Clemens Hauser showed us that in New York City two weeks ago, um, it came through that um, migrants um, can vote um, in next year. And it was very, very moving to hear um, this speech of um, a council member who actually says maybe cities are the moment or the point where this all connects and uh, for a global democracy. And um, I give now over to Ophelie from the um, office in uh, our office of European Alternatives in Brussels and Paris. And um, just for you to know, I will be a consecutive translator for Tarek, uh, who will speak in German. But um, uh, I will try my best and all others. Um, you, at the end, we will have uh, an, a situation where you can ask questions to the panelists um, who are still present and also your remarks. So until then, um, I give the floor now to Ophelie and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Kasha. Uh, hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, so my name is Ophelie Masson. I work for European Alternatives as a program coordinator, and I also do some activism on the side when I have the time to. Um, so I um, define myself usually as a bridge between citizens and the European institutions. Uh, and I always try to make this, uh, this link between what is comprehensible for the citizens and uh, the jargon of the institutions. So I try to be that bridge. Um, I am a lesbian, so I also try to fight for queer rights whenever I get the chance to. And the definition of not having the same rights in uh, each country is, uh, of course, very close to me as well, because, of course, as a, an LGBTI person, uh, this is an obvious uh, thing to say, perhaps, but always good to remind it, um, such as voting rights as well. It's uh, really different from one country to the next, and even within the European Union, not all member states have the same legislations, of course. Um, so without further ado, I suggest that we dive into the conversation right now. Um, so I am very pleased to introduce our first uh, speaker of the panel of this evening, uh, which is uh, Mrs. Canon Byram. Sorry for the pronunciation of the name. Uh, you are a member of the Bundestag uh, for the Berlin constituency. Um, and you're going to give us your statement uh, this evening uh, to which the other members of the panel will uh, react to afterwards. I, I know you have a limited time, so I'm gonna try to, to stick to, to the clock. Uh, we will have uh, Tarek Alawas uh, who will uh, give his reaction to, to your statement. Um, and hopefully we will then be able to have the other speakers jumping in. We will have Daniel Gutierrez, who gave a keynote uh, earlier today, uh, and we will have also Catriona Mer. Um, so without further ado, I give you the floor um, for this statement. Uh, Kanan Bayram, uh, and 
I let you take the mic. Yes, thank you very much. Good, good evening. My name is Ajanan Bairam, which means Ajanan, my first name uh, is, um, has the meaning of darling. So everybody is calling me darling, but I'm trying not to be everybody's darling. So at least this um, issue we are talking on today is uh, an issue I'm working on as a politician and as a lawyer since 2006 because of the discrimination in uh, election means that the um, worth of people were divided. Uh, so the group or the society in a country or in a city is divided in the people who count and the others uh, whom voices are not heard or at least is not um, welcomed in a democratic uh, way. So my um, area where I'm elected is uh, Friedrichshain Kreuzberg, especially Kreuzberg has a lot of people like me from uh, Turkey, born in Turkey, raised in Germany, or a lot of them also born in Berlin and raised here, uh, have not the German citizenship and therefore they are not um, part of the election, they are not able to vote, they are not able to be elected at the same time. And in my opinion, it is a discrimination which is wrong and which has to be changed uh, the sooner the better. Because the right to vote is a very important political right. I myself was 30 years old when I had my first election. So before this time, I knew that if you are, don't have the same political rights, you are not able to do the same political fight. And therefore, at least uh, you are, have to uh, talk today about the uh, campaign Deutsche Wohnen und Co. and Eignen, which is a campaign in Kreuzberg where it started and got over the whole town of Berlin but especially the people who are in a uh, difficult situation, in difficult uh, flat situation, were not able to get part in these elections to vote for the recommendation of flats all over the city. So at least I'm fighting for the right of the people to vote and uh, to be elected because in my view, there are a lot of positive effects of the possibility of the people to be part in a society. I think especially the integration of people um, is very necessary. And at the same time, the people, uh, if they could vote, if they could use all political rights they could be a better part of the society and the political differentiation between people who are able to vote and other people who are not able to vote um, makes a lot of problems. And I think we have to change this. And therefore, I think the whole daily situation of the people sending their children to the same schools like the other people, having maybe at least the same problems uh, like the other people without having the possibilities to change the political situation uh, makes a big difference in the daily life of the uh, people. So therefore now uh, we are at the Green Party in the federal parliament part of the uh, coalition and there we started a campaign. Now we are working on a law to make it possible for more people to get the German citizenship because the citizenship is the point where the election law in Germany is based on. And in Germany, there is a special difficulty that this uh, possibility to vote is in the... Um, we call it Grundgesetz, it's in our um, 
in our law, which has uh, a lot of um, tradition. And at the same time, it is very difficult to change this law. So we need a lot of uh, information and a lot of solidarity in the society to change uh, this law. This is what I want to uh, take point on, that it is very difficult to change the electional law in Germany. Maybe to this point, it was my input. Thank you very much uh, for, for your statement piece and uh, for, for taking the time to, to be with us. Um, maybe Tarek, you want to, to dive in already and to, to give your reaction. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, um... Kasia uh, said that I will talk in German. I don't know, you, you are hearing me. So, um, ich würde jetzt mit Deutsch anfangen, um, Kasia. Ja, Tarek, los geht's. Mach das gerne und danach würde ich, um, then I would um, translate it for the English speakers, the main ah, points. So, um, should, I, uh, or, uh, should I like talk in short sentences and you can yes, translate? Yes, perfect. Okay, Thank I, you. I thought we, we are using the translating tool. Um, okay. Ähm, vielen Dank, ähm, Canan, ähm, für deinen ähm, Input. Ähm, ich finde es richtig gut ähm, und von meiner Seite würde ich sagen, wenn wir über Menschen sprechen, ähm, die in Deutschland nicht wählen dürfen, sprechen wir über ungefähr 10 Millionen Menschen. Um, so, thank you for Janan for being here and um, when we speak about people who can't vote in Germany, it's 10 million people. Um, I, I think I will try. Um, okay. <laughs> it's, it's better for me. So we are talking like about 14% from the um, civil society in whole of Germany. Um, persons who couldn't get the German citizenship and couldn't vote. And like you, you talked about it, your first election was um, or was with 30 years old. My first election, uh, election was also this year with 30 t uh, with 32 years old so it's it's like the same situation for the most of migrants um here um here in germany and there is many persons who can't get the citizenship in some points it's about the criteria of the laws that are the green party um trying now to change with um or to make it better or um like easier um, and i am also like a part of the civil society but also a part of the green party um and try to work also in this case um with with the persons in the party but other ways it will like fit the situation of like one million persons or two million persons, but we are still talking about eight million who can't um, vote anymore. And it's like, we can, we can do these criteria as easy as we want. There will, there will be like a part of persons who can't get the resident, uh, residency of Germany, the, like the citizenship, because we have like um, asylum seekers here. We have, um, persons in Germany with um, like a very short, a short um, permit to stay, like the temporary one, who can't get directly the citizenship. They need a longer one and afterwards um, the, the citizenship. So we are just about the asylum seekers and the persons with this um, um, status, the Duldung. Um, it's like we are talking about one million persons who can't get the citizenship. There is also many persons who don't want to get the citizenship because they will lose their other citizenship from their mother countries. And it's also like an issue um, when we are talking about 10 million persons who couldn't vote in this year, like one million of them maybe couldn't get the citizenship, but there is many persons who can get it, but had reasons to not apply for it to not lose anything. Um, we have persons who can't like reach the criteria because there is many persons who get all of the criteria or 
um, fits everything, but like traumatized because of the wars they um, they experienced um, um, the the um, way to Germany, like um, um, and these persons can't, for example, just start working because of their healthy healthy situation, either men mental health or also like a, um, a body health. So. Um, I think this step to change this law, it's like the first step on the way to give all the persons who are living here this right of the vote, um, of voting. Like we are talking about the democracy um, and our democracy, I think, have to be or have to include every person in this society. So it's very good to have this first step um, and I really appreciate the work that you are doing, um, Jana. You are maybe one of the um, very few persons or politicians in this country who is talking very clear about this um, issue. Um, and the question, how can we like civil society also support these steps to, go, to get maybe after the next elections, the step that everyone could vote. And like, it's a process. I know it because I'm like not just on the side of the civil society, but also on the on the um, political party side. So I know these processes, but at the at the um, other side, um, I'm trying to be like or to have this connection. What ha what we have to do, like a civil society, to reach the other steps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tarek. There was a, a lot of questions and uh, a lot of. Uh... Of material to to think of um maybe Sanaz, if you want to um, ask a question as well uh to zan and, and maybe then uh if you can respond to to both questions at the same time uh please Sanaz, go ahead thank you thank you and uh, janan also for being here so my question is that um beside what Tara said i think it's really important to also talk about um, the coalition agreement that came in November. And interestingly, even though the Green Party, for example, and the, and I mean, the left party is not in the government, but still, even, even though the progressive parties are really for the um, change of the voting rights, still the issue, the matter of voting rights was not even in the coalition agreement, even though that the a, there, there, I mean, there was a mentioning of changing and um, reforming the voting rights for the people who were under the age of 16, um, but over the age, yeah, under the age of 16, no, 18 to 16, but there was no mentioning of voting rights for everyone or for all of the people who are living here. Um, there was no mentioning of it in the coalition agreement. So what I want to ask is that, how is that possible that, for example, the SPD and the Green are both for this? They're all, they're both apparently for voting rights for everyone, but when the coalition agreement of this government is coming out, there is nothing, I mean, even if there is a commission to change the voting rights, there is no mentioning of that. That's my first question. And second thing is that, again, in the coalition agreement, it was written, um, that the residency would be easy or, or to get the German citizenship would be easier for people. So now um, you want to read or the German parliament want to reduce the amount of years, um, I think to five and to three, but still they haven't mentioned any of the other criteria that are actually the essential criteria for people and are the barriers why people cannot apply for German citizenship. The more or the most important ones is the income, for example, that many of the people, as Tara said, and don't have a stable income, they don't have the working contracts, they're working in precarious situation, people who are working part-time, people who are taking care of their children and caregivers and all of the, everybody who is actually getting mostly affected by the new liberal society and cannot, I mean, the worker, um, a class are being affected by it the most and they're the people who actually cannot get German citizenship but there is no talking about that there's just talking about um developing the um the immigration politics and making it easier for for people to apply for German citizenship but the question is that for whom will it be 
get easier for the people who already are priv privileged and have better situation for the good migrants or for everyone. And then as Tarek said, still, I think the topic is very important. Of course, this could be a first step, but at the same time, this, this cannot be the last step because this is not just about voting rights, it's about the democracy and which people are getting actually actually excluded from this democracy and why people still need, why the nationality still says who have which rights and who is being excluded from democratic rights and who's not. So that's something that we should change. Thank you very much, Tanaz. Uh, and it also opens to the rest of the conversation indeed, how do we connect the voting rights to a larger spectrum of democracy rights um, in, a, in a broader scale. Um, maybe, Janan Barim, you want to, to react to this, to the multi-layer difficulty that people face to access citizenship and also why maybe citizenship is not always the answer that could actually ensure uh, stronger civil rights for people. Mm -hmm. Well, at least um, I can make it short because, you know, I totally agree. And what you said, uh, it is not fair to uh, make the decision that people who don't have the citizenship are not uh, able to vote. So at least for the local election, the European citizen uh, are able to vote and uh, to get voted at the same time. It's not only about uh, voting for somebody. It's also at the same time to be able to do your own political work, you know, and uh, to, um, to change this, we have to change the constitution, which we call Grundgesetz, which is the common law in, um, in, in Germany. We need a three quarters majority. And this is the, um, the biggest, um, problem in this uh, issue and you know till the 19, uh, 1980s we are working on this uh, political issue we are working on this and in the um, European Union it started with the possibility for the European citizens uh, for the local election. But if you look at the other European countries, you see that there is a lot of different uh, procedures, how the um, national states work on it. There are some states who make it possible, especially for this uh, so-called European mobiles who live a few years and work in different uh, European countries. Uh, they make it possible for them to get a, like a European citizenship or to get uh, something like uh, the possibility to um, vote in every election in the countries. But Germany is really in a very, very bad situation. On the one hand, because of the social situation in the community, but at the other hand, also on the local situation and the uh, law situation that the constitution needs a three quarters majority to change this law. In this law, it is written that only German citizens are um, allowed uh, to take part in the election. So this is the big problem. And why the um, ample coalition did not write into the coalition agreement that they want to change this also, I think uh, is a very good question. And I like you so much to uh, give this uh, question to all members of the uh, German parliament, the Deutsche Bundestag, because I think the only solution can be to talk on it, to talk on this discrimination in democracy, which it is. You know, at the same time, if you are discriminated in uh, political rights, in getting uh, voted or voting, then uh, it makes your, um, your possibilities and uh, your voice uh, smaller and takes your possibility to uh, 
yes, fight against discrimination. And therefore, I think we have to talk very loud about this discrimination on election. We have to fight against it and change the law, especially the constitution. And we need a lot of people to help us because, you know, 10 million people are not enough. I think we need a lot of more people. And I like to uh, support as much as I can because for me, it's really a really very, very important uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just maybe add one question if you still have a few minutes uh, going from that. The fact that uh, equal access to voting rights for all was not mentioned in the, um, the agreement of the coalition. Does that mean that this point will not be discussed and will not change until the next federal elections? So at least, you know, the, uh, the far right party, AfD, has about 10%. And the uh, Christ Democrats have also um, about uh, 30%. So together they have a majority to uh, fight any law which has the aim to change the um, election system on uh, the people who are uh, able to be elected because in this constitution it's written only the German citizenships gives you the possibility to uh, be part of the um, of the election. Uh, just the people from the European Parliament, uh, from the European other European countries, have the possibility to vote on the local. You know, like Bezirk, uh, Friedrichshain, Kreuzberg, uh, not the uh, country Berlin or things like that. So, therefore, I think we have. Uh, to uh, change the constitution and to change, change the constitution, we need three quarter majority. And so therefore, um, to answer your question, yes, I don't think that the law will be changed in the next four years, but not because the Apple or coalition or uh, they don't want it, you know, at least the um, social Democrats want it, the Green Party wants it, and the liberals, I'm not sure, but I think they are not against it at the same time. Um, but we have to be more. We have to, we need more millions to change the law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for your time uh, and, and for being, uh, jo for joining this uh, event uh, tonight. Um, I think you have to, to go now, um, unless you, you can follow the discussion a bit more, of course, you're more than welcome to, to stay with us. Um, uh, then moving on a bit, uh, I, I very slightly not even introduced you, Tarek, uh, before, as I felt brushed by the clock, but I will take the time to do so now. Um, so, Tarek Alawas, uh, so uh, you are a member of the Green Party, as you were saying yourself before. You are also um, an active campaigner uh, with the Leave No One Behind uh, campaign. Uh, and you're also the spokesperson of the Federal Working Group on Migration and Refugees for, for the Greens. Um, so I would maybe uh, want to, and I will introduce, sorry, the, the three, um, the two other speakers at the same time, and then I will, I will ask you some, some questions, let's say some uh, inspirational questions that I would be curious uh, for you to react to um, that will guide us through also what you were mentioning before, Sanaz, of opening the, the discussion on bigger issues and bigger principles, uh, such as the right to, to be active, an active participant in democracy. Um, so we have also with us uh, Sanaz Azimipur, who is the co-founder of Miglum and a member of the campaign, excuse my German, Nicht holen uns 14%. Uh, so you can, of course, uh, you, you spoke uh, with us earlier this evening uh, with a very, of course, a good presentation of a successful campaign that you, you had on migrants' uh, voting rights, uh, where you exposed what made it work and maybe what could be improved for, for later uh, campaigns. Uh, we have also Daniel Gutierrez, who is a member of the working group Right to the City for All at Dutch Woen. Um, and you also gave a talk, a keynote earlier, which was very inspirational on 
on what I get from it is what kind of life do we want to, to lead and to participate in, really. Um, and then we have also with us Catriona Mayer, who is from the Essage Foundation and the Voters Without Borders campaign, who is also co-organizing um, this event uh, this evening. Um, so maybe Tarek, after this exchange uh, with, uh, with your uh, uh, Bundestag elect uh, before, uh, I would like to, to jump on that and to, to ask you, um, maybe for you, what do you see as being um, needed to build stronger alliances between movements um, and citizen movements and institutions? like the one that uh, she was representing uh, this evening with us. How do, we, how do we build stronger alliances between those two entities? Ich weiß eigentlich nicht, um, ob das miteinander zusammengeht. Also am Ende sprechen wir über ein Thema. Es gibt Menschen, die von einer bestimmten gesetzlichen Lage, von einer bestimmten ähm, politischen Situation betroffen sind und es gibt politische Parteien. Natürlich gibt es Allianzen zwischen Politik und Bewegungen. Ähm, es braucht aber immer wieder eine Kritik, also eine kritische Bewegung, eine kritische Zivilgesellschaft, die einfach ganz genau beobachtet, was die Politik macht und dann ähm, bereit wäre, immer dagegen zu reagieren. Also das hat auf jeden Fall eine Rolle. Und es hat auf jeden Fall, also wir brauchen auf jeden Fall auch Allianzen. Wir brauchen politische Parteien wie die Grünen, wie die Linken, die einfach an manchen Stellen uns unterstützen können. Also ich habe immer eine sehr schwierige Rolle hier, weil ich ein Teil der Zivilgesellschaft bin und bei der Zivilgesellschaft meinen Aktivismus angefangen habe ähm, und meiner politischen Arbeit angefangen habe und dann irgendwann in der politischen Partei. Aber wenn es dazu kommt, eine Abwägung zu machen, auf welcher Seite ich sein würde, dann würde ich einfach ähm, sagen, ich bin einer von der betroffenen Menschen, die 2015 in Deutschland angekommen sind. Ich wurde einfach an mehreren Stellen in diesem ähm, Land diskriminiert, rassistisch begegnet und ähm, wurde betroffen von strukturellen Rassismus, von mehreren ähm, oder in mehreren Situationen. Von daher, meine Seite wird immer auf der Seite der Betroffenen. Ähm, ich maybe, sehe maybe, immer. Maybe we'll let Cassia translate this, this yeah. first bit. Yes, um, I will try my best and uh, thank you for. We're experiencing a very uh, multilingual and multi uh, European event today. Uh, I love it. So I just, um, Tarek, um, um, reacting to the question of alliances and movements, um, alliances between movements and parties. Um, you said really the question, um, Tarek said the question, he doesn't really know if we can really think this together right now. Um, he of, uh, we have people who are being affected by politics and we have people in political power. And um, of course we can create alliances But we need um, we need a critical civil society that creates a discourse, but also disrupts or, or creates the discourse in the party politics. And what you or what Tarek really said in his personal story was that he started his political work uh, in a political party, the Greens. But he is in the end because he came um, to Germany 2015. He is um, a person that is affected by um, structural racism in this country and he always sees himself as a person just being if usually also i betroffenen seite is not victim i would say it's the person that is affected by structural uh, violence um, political but structural also political um, situations and um may Tarek go on and um please um say if you think i'm saying shit <laughs> sorry yeah, no 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 <laughs> Um, it's it's okay. Um, I think you say the most of the thing, um, um, but like I started my political work in the civil society before um, I was like a member of the Greens. I'm like member of this political party like since um, one or two years um, now, but in the civil society I started directly my work, so I'm working on this level like since six years. Um, What I think, um, like what what Chanan said, um, is also like right on the other way. We have also like when we are talking about the civil society, we are not just talking about everyone who share the same opinion with us. We are talking about um, like 
parts of the civil society who are also discriminating um, refugees and migrants. <clears throat> we are talking about um, like, I will not say a strong left um, uh, or a right wing in, in the society, but I will say like an extremist right wing. We are talking about about like a, um, um, a right wing party, the, the alternative for Germany, um, whom have been voted or which have been voted with 10% of the all of the, the voters um, at the last year or at the last year or um, at the last elections. So I think to change um, some um, some like institute uh, no <laughs> my English um, wenn wir einfach den Grundgesetz zum Beispiel bei, beim Thema Wahlrecht wenn wir dabei bleiben und wir den Grundgesetz ändern würden dann stoßen wir an eine politische Linie von mehreren Parteien die das nicht ähm, nicht sofort hinnehmen auf der anderen Seite, wir haben auch große Anteile von der Zivilgesellschaft, die das auch so supportet. Also es ist ja sehr traurig, so zu sagen, dass wir fast oder über die Hälfte unserer Zivilgesellschaft sind Menschen, die einfach entweder konservativ oder rechts gewählt haben. Das ist, das ist ja einfach traurig, auch mit den, mit den großen Ereignissen, die in den letzten Jahren passiert. Also wir haben... Ähm, wir hatten mehrere Angriffe, Anschläge an Migrantinnen und Menschen ähm, in Deutschland. Wir hatten Hanau. Wir hatten vor ein paar Tagen den, den, An den Anschlag in Halle. Es wurde auch eine Mos Moschee erschossen einfach. Ähm, mehrere Angriffe. Und trotzdem gibt es Anteile von der Zivilgesellschaft, die sich einfach rechts oder konservativ positionieren. So, um, Tarek is saying, um, when we speak about voting rights for all, we, as Jana mentioned, we need to speak, and it was also part of the um, participants' questions uh, in the chat, we need to talk about also changing the so-called uh, Grundgesetz, which is the common law in the German, uh, German national society, which is very hard to change because of reasons. Um, but... Um, What uh, Tarek says, it's not only the political unwill or not will, willing of, of the coalition parties or the people in power, but we have a civil society, as you said, Tarek, that voted um, half, um, half of the civil society voted right wing or even also part of it extreme white right wing. And although we had extreme, um, we had terrorist attacks and right wing attacks during the last years, like um, Halle, Halle and Hanau, where um, migrants were specifically targeted. And um, so I, um, you were mentioning that this is, of course, something we, we have to talk about, that the civil society itself um, is right wing and we need a civil society to kind of will or part of the civil society to change the Grundgesetz or the common law. Um, I will not say all of the civil society um, or the half of the civil society are um, or um, is right wing, but conservative or right wing. So, um, who like like persons who are not welcoming migrants or refugees in this country. So, um, I think we have to we have to start there. We have to start at this point to see how can we um, be stronger with our like campaigning, with our um, um, political work to just, um, to, or to try to get majorities in the civil society. Um, it needs a cooperation with political parties. Um, I'm not sure how, how could it be because it's still also at the other side, it's still critical, just that like civil society movements cooperating or to see civil society movements cooperating with political parties. So I have also also this difficult situation because like also in the in the um, party politics, I'm the person who is coming from the civil society, but also in the civil society, I'm the person who is connected with political parties. So uh, like I'm not enough for the both sides and I don't know How long can it um, still or uh, still working like that? Uh, thank you very much, Tarek. Um, yeah, and and Kasia for the translation of also. Um, yeah, I I see what you mean, Tarek, and I I think it's uh, it's very important also the role that you decide to take on 
to be that connection between uh, the civil society and between the political party. Um, but so I wonder what type of maybe um, criticism you might be getting from the civil society, because from the polit political party, I think we can all imagine, but from the civil society, the kind of criticism or delegitimization that you might get because you decided to associate yourself with a certain political party um, and how that maybe makes it harder to, to connect also with the civil society. Um, before we, we, we go into that, maybe in too much details, I, I want to also ask the other speakers who are here to, to react um, and to, to explain maybe what, what is your vision for a possible change without having to maybe wait for the three quarters uh, to be there because it seems to be very hard, of course, to, to be able to, to change things th throughout the, the constitutional change, which requires um, too much of, uh, of a coalition, basically. Um, so maybe, Sanaz, as uh, you, you were also uh, in conversation earlier with uh, the, the politician who was there, the institutional representative who was there, um, maybe I would be also keen on, on hearing what is your your take on how do we make this connection between the institutions and civil society, or if you're leaning maybe towards more strategy like Tarek explained, of maybe not necessarily for now building on a connection between the two, but focusing more on making civil society stronger at the moment. Um, yeah, thank you. I think it's a really good question. I think what first of all, I what I wanted to say after what Tara said and after what Chanan said, I think it's very important to see on which side we are standing. I think you cannot compare the role of the people who are sitting in the parliament with the role of the people who are active within the civil society because of obvious reason. People who are working within the civil society, the campaigners, the activists, the initiatives don't have even that much resources. Uh, while people who are actually living in parliament are the people who are being voted, they're the people who are being, I mean, they're also politicians who are working as politicians, so they're being paid to be there. They have all the networks, they have all the resources. So I see actually the main pressure should be on the politics because we cannot, I think this is the, I mean, for me, it's a really wrong side and to point at to point at civil society why we're not doing enough because i think civil society is already is doing enough i think it's really important that the parliament actually does its job because they are the ones who have all of the resources and it is actually their job to do this and at the same time i agree that when the civil society is the one who votes for the right wing's party or conservatives party, of course, the people who are also coming to the parliament are their representation. So it, I see that also as a cycle that those who are voting for them will also vote for those who are representing them. At the same time, and I think by raising awareness and talking about that topic, of course, we can change something in this, in this circle. But at the same time, I think it is very also possible for the, again, for the government or for the people who are sitting in the parliament to be way more progressive than the civil society. In many of the cases, it is like this. I mean, I, I'm not sure if now there would be a referendum about abortion, how many people will vote against the abortion. So I think it's also really possible uh, that while the society have conservative uh, standing, still the government will have progressive takes and steps. Um, the other thing is that I think the civil society can still, uh, I mean, I am part of the civil society uh, and I think um, it's, I think we can do, I mean, what we can do is that we can, I think, connect the struggles, we can mobilize more people, organize more people, that's what we can do. We can use our tiny resources to mobilize more people. But the, the thing is with the voting rights is that it's also again the loop. As long as the people who don't have the voting rights cannot vote, they cannot also vote for the people who want them to have voting rights. So <laughs> this should also change within its system. And I mean, now I, I had to check again. So more than 50% of the people voted for more progressive parties, if we count, I don't know, Green and SPD as progressive parties. And um, so, well, <laughs> but, but, and that means something. That means actually the parties who have been elected, like SPD or like Green or like F, 
they pay it's not progressive, but at the same time, the, the parties who have been elected, and they could actually take a stance and they can actually change something. And what I said about the coalition agreement is one of the examples, because we have individual politicians who are supporting our campaign, for example, our demand of voting rights, but in the end, when they when it comes to making an agreement, the topic will not even come up in the co whole coalition agreement. That's why that I think it is very important that they also, if they really support it, they have to put pressure on it because the civil society cannot do it alone. Um, and also, I think, like, um, I mean, as they say from, I think that this is a very, it's it's a very also always the discussion that we have with the politicians always like this basically that we say yeah we want to change that law and all the politicians will come and say yes it's very hard to change that law yeah of course it's really hard to change the constitution but if anybody could change that constitution are the people who are sitting there so I see that as their responsibility to put pressure to change that constitution also at the same time just want to add something else. Um, in the sense of uh, German citizenship and voting rights, I mean, it's in the constitution, it's written um, Deutsches Volk. And there was no interpretation till I think 1984 on what Volk means because it uh, there's there are different um, legal interpretation of what that means. Um, and since 1984 and the, the constitution, court um, said that that means actually German citizens. But that's actually a, a kind of a bright light because it means that once it was interpreted this way, that means that it can also, there, there could be also other interpretation. So that could be also another way. So if they put pressure, maybe they can also change the interpretation of that law. And um, yeah, that's what I want to say for now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sanaz. Uh, and I'm learning so many things tonight uh, of my fellow uh, German residents and citizens. So it's very interesting also from an international perspective, of course. Um, going more international also, uh, I would like to, to give the floor to Daniel uh, and then to, to Catriona, who will uh, give also maybe a, a European and also more international perspective on this. Uh, Daniel, what to, what would be your take on these different positions that uh, Tarek and San has explained uh, that they have on the, the best way forward to go through an alliance, a stronger alliance between institutions or civil society, or actually focusing more on one or the other um, to, to maximize the, the efficiency of changing for, for voting rights? Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you, everyone else that came before me and said incredible things. Um, I, I think at the end that, um, I mean, both are correct insofar as we understand that the state obviously has some powers and civil society has other powers. Um, but the state is kind of the, in terms of parties, um, parties tend to harvest already existing political will. And so the question is, how do you generate new political will and new political attitudes? And that has to be, it's not a chicken or egg thing, but uh, obviously uh, you have to generate that outside of the state so that the state can then harvest that, so that political parties can then harvest that the next time around. And I think that um, you know, political attitudes are not static. Uh, as we've seen historically, people's ideas or sensibilities of what is normal and okay changes over time. And so the question is, how do we, how do we develop that? Um, more importantly, though, I think that we need to develop uh, a new political subjectivity and sensibility that's actually, uh, that addresses actual problems according to the scale at which they are rather than trying to fit those problems into the existing tools that we have as well. Um, and this is uh, perhaps the, the problem that I was trying to raise in the keynote address is that I, I think if we begin from the question of the legality, rather than the question of the actually existing needs and how these needs are tied to everyone's problem, that everyone currently feels that they cannot, that most people, currently feel that they do not have the capacity to change the world around them, even though they see that uh, things are not going in their favor. And the perfect example of this is ecological catastrophe. 
like everyone knows that there's a problem and they're reduced to the most basic individual kind of ways to change it in, in the sense of, I guess I'll buy bio now, or I'll try to buy regional goods. And then when we, we, when we try to flex our vote, like in the case of Deutsche Wohnen Co. and Eichmann for a radical departure and say, I wanted to go that way, then suddenly we come into an impasse where the government then says, I'm sorry, but uh, maybe in two years, we'll come up with an answer to this, but maybe there'll be other problems and hopefully then there won't be that kind of pressure from the perspective of some actors within the state apparatus right now. I'm not saying that the Greens think this or something like that, but there are definitely actors within the, the state apparatus that want this to go away. So the question then is how can we develop the, the kind of countervailing power outside of the state to continue to pressure that. And I think that this again goes into um, the necessity of civil society to be able to organize and to be able to organize itself to actually develop uh, the disruption needed for people to pay attention. I mean, once again, point to, to Deutsche von Cohen Eichen, the state was following um, political will being developed in civil society, right? Um, you had years of protests that begin to develop a threat in the form of expropriation and then the state and the last government says in Berlin, okay, well, maybe we'll put a rent cap. And then they put a rent cap in the hope that that will make the problem go away and then it doesn't. And then the political will continues to, to, to develop. I think that the, the um, what we have to do is also think about how to make the conditions possible so that ordinary people can organize themselves to be able to develop that kind of power. And that means also developing like good Kita structures so that I don't have to like, like, you know, there's this crisis in daycare in Berlin before the pandemic, well before the pandemic. And now it's just a flashpoint that is now creating a bunch of economic problems and the same things at the schools. The more you have the schools functioning, the more that you have the daycares functioning, the more that you have better labor regimes that allow people to even be able to politically organize. Because this was one of the, the, the most common problems over my entire experience in Berlin in working with uh, other social groups, right? Is that shared time is impossible because of the current labor regime. Like how am I supposed to, organize across difference when all of our, when the, the, the labor process is itself so divided. Uh, how can I find a common meeting time with people to talk about politics if we're not in the same kind of uh, uh, economic category? And so this means that if you really care about these things, you also, like if you really care about people's ability to organize then you also really have to care about labor regimes to be able to give them the space to organize themselves and develop that kind of pressure. Um, and so uh, I think when we, when we think about this, uh, you know, the, the current actors in the state could also be fighting to push for things like that to make it easier for people to develop that kind of force outside. And we have to think about ways to engage people, to, um, to engage people in order to develop new political sensibilities and to combine these into a kind of unified project. Because once again, um, you know, citizenship, I don't want the avenue to be citizenship because, um, you know, that was brought up before that next year, like for so many different laborers, next year I might end up in Poland or next year I might end up in Italy, next year I might end up in England that doesn't fit to the reality. This is an outdated concept and we need new political modalities of expression that actually fit the current problems that we have, especially in an ecological crisis. Like things that are way beyond my uh, little zone in Germany or in Berlin affect me heavily. And so we need to, to develop new imaginings of politics and develop the political will from the grassroots is what I'm trying, trying to say at the end of the day. And, and this means that we need civil society and we also need state actors currently in place to develop the breathing space for us to be able to do that. Like even if they cannot get us the vote right now, they need to develop the, the, the spaces for us to be able to organize for that vote.
Thank you, Daniel. We can, we can see that you're, you're embodying your, your ideas and uh, you have the fire coming into you. Um, Sorry. It's like <laughs> so don't Latin that. hand movements. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, I, I very much, um, I mean, uh, agree with, with what you said, a lot of things you, you said. Um, I really like the parallel that you make between uh, campaigning for voting rights and citizenship rights and, or, and democratic rights and, and the environment um, campaigns. Um, I, I very much agree with this parallel when it comes to the matter of responsibility and this idea that, for instance, when we talk about the environment, that the responsibility falls on two citizens to pick the organic uh, products at the supermarket and to pick the organic, uh, like sustainable little things at the supermarket, when in reality, this is a drop in the ocean. And if we want to make actual global sustainable change, it needs to be at a much bigger level and at a much higher level that individual citizens don't have the, the power themselves to change alone, uh, but that together they can put pressure for uh, these institutions to take the decisions that will make those uh, sustainable changes. So I, I very much agree with the, the parallel uh, between those those two things. Um, I will I will give the floor to to Kefriona uh, Mayor now from the Acid Foundation and the Voters Without Borders campaign, uh, who will also give us this uh, European perspective and which links perfectly well with the last things that you were mentioning also, Daniel, which is that, well, if we change uh, the access accessibility to citizen citizenship in, in Germany, fine, it might help for a limited period of time, but then th those people will move countries for labor or other reasons, and then their rights will actually be back to uh, the state where they were before. Uh, so how do we avoid that? And how do we make sure that uh, accessibility to to voting is actually a global right. Katrina, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Cassia and Ophelie for organizing this. It has been great so far. And thanks to all the panelists for speaking. Uh, I have a lot to react to what you've been saying. It's been very interesting. So like Ophelie said, uh, I'm part of ESIT Foundation and we are a think tank that focuses on uh, European citizenship. And one of our overall aims of our work is how do we reform uh, EU citizenship to become more popular and more resilient? And one of the main things is voting rights. And we know that it all has flaws. Um, so EU citizens have the right to vote and stand as candidates in local and European elections, um, as we've discussed, but not in regional and national um, in their country of residence. Currently, there are 13.5 million mobile EU citizens who are deprived of their voting rights uh, in regional elections, uh, national elections and referendums. So ESIT uh, put together a task force of young Erasmus students and young graduates to solve this issue. And we came up with uh, voter, voting Voters Without Borders. And um, Voters Without Borders is a European Citizens Initiative. Um, and this initiative requires 1 million signatures um, from EU citizens uh, with a threshold of a minim minimum of seven member states. And the ECIs uh, ultimately aim to propose new European legislation if uh, a million signatures are collected. So the Votes of Our Borders campaign demands for full political rights for EU citizens in the country of their residence. And we have until the 11th of June this year. So I would really ask everyone to sign it um, before the end of the call, uh, because we really need those signatures. And the two main aims are to make existing rights of uh, EU citizens to vote and stand as candidates in European and local elections in their country of residence fit for purpose. And the second is to extend these rights to regional and national elections and referendums. Uh, you know, ultimately, no EU citizens should have to make the choice between exercising their rights of freedom uh, and exercising their right to vote. Um, I have several things to react to. Uh, firstly, it was about the resources. Um, we, as a campaign, we're struggling to get signatures. I wouldn't be here telling you that I need you to sign it if we had targeted 
or those 13.5 million mobile EU citizens, you know, and this comes down to the fact that a lot of these citizens don't actually know about their rights. They don't know that they can vote in the member state that they're residing in for the European elections. Um, they just think that they have to go home to their member states. And this is like a broader problem in itself. We need to, we need to have this kind of um, education and awareness and guidance about uh, political voting rights for these for EU citizens. And for us, if we had this guidance, it would be so much easier to approach people on the street and say, can you sign this? This means that you can vote uh, in any member states that you might live in in the next five years and going to live there for the next 10 years. And that's one of the biggest struggles that we had, that people just don't get it. It's not a simple campaign. Um, other ECIs that have reached a million signatures have been very simple. They've been save the bees. That makes sense. Everyone gets it. <laughs> you know, so save the bees. So this is what we're struggling. And so like we were saying with the resources, we're trying to go with politicians. We've got a lot, a lot of MEPs who are supporting us. You know, it's great that they're supporting us, but at the same time, like what are they actually doing for us? They can just, you know, promote it on their, on their social media. So it's a really fine line um, between both, both worlds. And I, I think we still need both, but it's still a struggle. Um, and your, your point, uh, Daniel, on citizenship, I just want to add, um, this is coming from a personal story. So I'm British, as you can probably tell by my accents, um, but my parents are British expats and I was born in Brussels and I was raised here. Um, so my parents at the time had no issues working uh, and living here. Um, but as British uh, expats, um, you lose your voting rights after 15 years of living outside the UK. Um, but And they weren't Belgian citizens, they were Belgian res residents, which meant that they could only vote in local and European elections. So at some point in time, um, because I was under 18, my family had no voting rights, um, even though they were tax residents in both countries. So this was like a, a message that we were saying before in the conversation, taxation without representation. And then, um, and then Brexit happened, <laughs> which we all know what happens. And long story short, I had to go to court to fight for my Belgian citizenship. Um, I won. And since then, I have gained um, my, my right to vote as a Belgian citizen. And I was studying in the UK um, and as a, as a British citizen and resident, um, I could also vote in the UK elections. So I have voted uh, in five elections in the, the space of three years. I feel so privileged to vote, but that shouldn't be the case. I should not feel so lucky to gain my Belgian citizenship at a price um, to exercise my, my right to vote. So for me, it makes sense that uh, I'm part of this campaign to help others who are in similar situations as me and other mobile EU citizens to have this right uh, to vote. So uh, I think someone shared the link in the chat. Um, yes, so if you could please all sign it, that would be great. Thank you very much, Kat. Um, so, and that was, of course, I, I knew the story before, but it's always uh, funny in brackets to, to hear it again, uh, that you had to, to go to court uh, with, your, with your lawyer uh, at age 18 uh, to, to get a voting right. It's, uh, it sounds uh, really ridiculous in, in actual fact, um, but that's what happened. Um, yes, please, Sana, of course, go ahead. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I have a question from you, Kat, because we are also both working on different campaigns. And because I think it's also a really interesting idea that you're working on. At the same time, I ask myself, you're now fighting for voting rights of European citizens within the European area. At the same time, I have to ask myself, this is just an somehow expansion of this idea of citizenship and 
voting rights being limited to certain citizenship from a certain nationality to just the broader uh, definition, which in this sense would be um, EU citizens. So EU citizens, which are already have in compared to other migrants, have a lot of other privileges, um, of course, including freedom of movement and everything else and freedom of voting, for example, in regional election um, will also have more rights, which is which is great. I think it's great if um, European will also have even more rights. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, the question is that how is that not including all of the other people who are being affected by this power structure of the racialized people, pure people who are in the first line getting discrimination from Frontex to um, immigration office who are living here since thousands of years and still don't have the citizenship. How is that possible to run such a campaign and not uh, including all of the other people who don't have the right citizenship, which is in this case, EU citizenship? Uh, thank you. Thank you for your, uh, your comments. No, I, I completely agree with you. Um, that we need we need something um, ESITS and Voters Without Borders needs um, a clear stance on uh, third country nationals, so non-EU um, citizens, and this is something that we're working towards at the moment. Um, because the campaign ends in June, um, we don't want that to end. We we want uh, the fights to continue, and this will include um, hopefully uh, soon. Uh, third country nationals. So we are working on it and I'm sure that if we keep in contact uh, and share details, we'd, we can work together and um, produce a stance on this. So I completely agree with you. Um, it's, in, it's in work in progress is all I can say at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, please, Tahak. And then uh, if you have questions, also the other people who are here, if you have questions, uh, feel free to, to pop up. I know that Clemens wants to ask a question also after, uh, but please, Tarek, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have just one comment about the discussion before. Um, I think I will be the last one who is like demanding from the civil society to um, do much more than it than it's doing now. Um, but the fact, or the fact now, like how many politicians do we have like have the same opinion we, uh, or like Chanan? If we want to hear that, it's very few. We can maybe like just um, count them on our um, hands, fingers, and they will be just finished. Um, so like, like you say, Daniel, um, this political change, that your campaign did started from the streets and it's like the reality, any political change will be applied in the next years. We'll just start from, from the streets. There, there will be no politicians who, give, who gives you your rights without you are demanding on streets and just saying it's my rights and I want to take it. So um, that's, that's the reason of my position now, because I, I think if we are just waiting of the German politics, giving migrants the right of, of um, voting, it will not happen. It will not happen like alone. It will not happen without thousands of persons who are just going and demanding that from the streets. And that's, that's my opinion. We have to work on strong campaigning at the next time to reach these thousands at least, and to go with them and to demonstrate with them and to demand with them from the political parties, all of them, I'm, I'm like not, not expecting um, or not expecting anything from political parties, from all of the political parties, we, we have to demand together and to get these rights together. I, I had it myself. I had it like in every step in my life in this country um, through like going through the, the, the borders of Europe and just demanding this right of free of movement to reach Germany and to demand on Germany just to have like a fair asylum process here. I was like six months here in Germany, six months long that um, when I when I was supposed 
to have like tents in front of the town hall of the small city of Bochum, just demanding my existing rights in the law that the city is not giving me, you know? So it's like, I, I will not just sit at home and wait that the, that the politicians give that because they will not give that. Without political pressure on streets, they will not give that. And the example is the campaign of um, um, Deutsche Wohnen and Eigen. Uh, it's, it's like the, the, the first example that I can um, see now. Thank you very much, Tarek. I think, I mean, I think this is an idea that is shared by, by the majority, if not everyone here, that for sure there is a need for a strong solidarity in like between the different groups of civil society, because civil society can be can unify in their strength, although it is very different and diverse, more diverse than the politicians are. And I think the idea is that, yes, we do need a strong civil society, but to put pressure on the politicians because they are the ones in the end who don't have the power to make an actual change for us. So I think this is, uh, yeah, the, the main uh, the mainstream, let's say. Um, Jörg, I see you have your hand up. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'll just give the floor to Clemens because he, he had wrote to me in the chat uh, and then I'll, I'll give you the floor, Jörg. Uh, Clemens, please go ahead. Thank you. I would like to uh, say something about the relation between politicians and the civil society. The important point is votes are a key to power. If you don't have a vote to give, you're not interesting for the ones who want to gain power, the politicians. So this is one suggestion I have why the coalition treaty in Germany does not address the question of the non-citizens who have no voting rights. There's much more votes and support to gain if you give people citizenship, because if they have citizenship, they can vote you directly. The road to non-citizens to become equal is a much longer road and politicians lose probably more power, more votes if they go this direction. So power is an important thing we have to look at as well. There is a good example in Hungary. Hungary has introduced under a social democrat government the voting rights of non-EU citizens when they became member of the European Union. Everybody would think that an autocratic, nearly dictator-like government like Viktor Orban would abolish the voting rights of non-citizens, but he didn't because it is his key to power because they have a, a regulation for citizens who have even a temporary residence in cities and they can live in Romania or in other places and they are 95%, a very high percentage of Fidesz supporters, which is the party of Viktor Orban. So he is not a Democrat and that's not the reason why he is supporting the voting rights of non-citizens, it's because of power. So if we look at what we can do, we have to look at the people who have power in the way of votes. And that's why we have to address as well the whole society. This is why we do when we do symbolic elections in the German network we vote or in Freiburg, we have a referendum for the people who have a voting right and we ask them, are you in favor of voting rights of immigrants, yes or no? And we have a thousand people participating and we have a 95% yes to the uh, to the votes uh, for for non-eu citizens so this is more interesting to politicians because these people already have a voting right so what we need to do is to form a big coalition and as um, daniel was saying it before if um, he was talking about the open space we should claim from the from the government and the politicians this is exactly what we should do because once the conservative, once the, the coalition of the social democrats, green and liberals, they didn't give they didn't even talk about the voting rights of non-citizens, but they can give us the space where we can organize and mobilize and build a coalition. So we should do that together. This is, I think, where we should concentrate on. And then last thing is we were looking closely to the women's rights movement in the world and even in Germany. And they had a similar problem. They had to convince men that they vote in the parliaments where only men are sitting to vote for a yes to give women the vote so that they would have less power. 
they they made it and it's and even we have a we have a easier situation we have politicians like Chanan who was here before and maybe Tarek will be somewhere there who can voice the 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 position for an equal democracy so we are in an easier easier position but my priority would be the civil society mobilization and the other thing we do in the network we vote is we concentrate on cities. So it's cities, it's the civil society is first. And if there's enough pressure, it will follow as Daniel was describing about the Deutsche Wohnen and Eignen, it will have effects on the politics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clemens. And um, this is a, of course a very relevant example that you, you make the parallel that you make with women's rights uh, to vote. Um, and the fact that indeed, it seems that there was even more uh, to overcome to, to get to that right um, than there is to get to migrants' uh, right to vote. Um, and it gives us a hopeful note also for, for this evening. Uh, York, please go ahead. Um, thank you a lot to all of you for, because this, I'm following this discussion and it's, it's, it's very, very inspiring. Um, um, and Clemens, also the last point you made made me think of something else. And I think it was kept because you mentioned those both worlds, you know, we are talking about civil society and political institutions as if there were no more worlds, you know. And I'm thinking about if our strategic um, approaches are too narrow because on the one hand, another world we should definitely talk about is the world of the people, just ordinary people around there who we try to organize and mobilize. How is our relationship of perhaps also sometimes in uh, civil society elites, let's call it like that, you know, or in activist elites towards ordinary citizens? At the same time, you mentioned a super important point that the right wing around Europe and the world has a perverse relationship towards migrants. On the one hand, uh, attacking them, and on the, one, uh, on the other hand, being very often dependent on them when it comes to elections. And the Hungary case is especially interesting. But I would like to stress two other points. When we look at the extension of political rights of migrants in Germany, there was an interesting case of the IG Metall, the German Indust Industrial Workers Labor Union, um, because they did a study and it showed that the 21% of migrants living in Germany had a similar you know, number of people with a migration background being represented in the union, exactly 21%. At the same time, it was also that migrants are disproportionately represented in active um, uh, volunteer structures in labor unions. And I think if we look at the migrant struggles in Germany, but also around the world, and as you mentioned, the women's struggles, um, when we look at the workers' movement, workers' rights and labor unions as another world are a crucial factor when it comes to extending political rights of working class migrant people, because they are the first step into the door of society. And this society is dependent on this workforce. And I believe, and I'm remembering the moment when Hanau, the terrorist attack happened. Uh, and uh, there was in a television, uh, one of one, Turkish old man who was uh, talking about the possibility of a migrant strike, you know? And a migrant strike, because this is also the experience of migrants very often, that this is their only way to fight. A migrant strike in some cases would be a possibility to overcome these institutional barriers because migrants have uh, at the same time in labor unions, um, perhaps more relations to those political rights debates than they have it with civil society. And not at all, please don't misunderstand me, against us as civil society. But I'm stressing the point that if we want to really reach out to ordinary people, we have to also build alliances with labor unions.
Thank you, Jörg. Uh, that was an opening to, to another conversation <laughs> and another, another way to explore, uh, to build alliances. Um, unfortunately, we don't have uh, enough time to, to go into a whole new discussion on, on that. Uh, but I hope this is, uh, yes, I, I see, Daniel, that you're very sad about that. Um, but uh, maybe this is a, an opportunity and an idea for, for another discussion uh, sometime soon. Um, in the meantime, I will give the floor to, to Kasia who will uh, maybe react to this conversation and uh, also uh, give us a, a conclusion to this very rich evening. Thank you, Georg, also for maybe stressing what we're planning with European alternatives in the coming years um, persistently <laughs> in our networks. And I think our networks are broadening. That makes me really happy. Um, but first of all, I would like to, um, how do I get my hand off? Okay. Um, first of all, I, <laughs> I would um, give the floor a little bit in the chat, or if there's some last reaction, um, we have really la the last 10 minutes, um, please share it also in the chat or chat with your fi favorite panelists, exchange numbers if you want. Um, what I would like to say is that um, this is just the start. and. Um, Next Saturday, we as European Alternatives Berlin are doing a workshop with our Academy of Migrant Organizing, where Daniel Guterres, um, our keynote speaker, um, is also one of the nine selected fellows. And um, in, this, um, in this workshop, we're trying to get to the questions we just opened up now. So um, from different sites. So we will have um, someone from the Polish diaspora um, speaking about really diaspora and democracy and also feminism and abortion rights and how to fight for democracy and women's rights through art, but in exile, um, maybe bringing in some new creative strategies. Then we will have, as Georg mentioned, someone who really puts in the center of the question of workers' migrants' rights. And I mean, we, I think, I, I also do believe this is the key key hole where we have to start and sharing something personal. My dad is a taxi driver. <laughs> and um, I think if we could connect to the amazing taxi drivers of Hamburg and Berlin and Cologne um, who speak and know so many people and get to know these people more and connect them to our political fights, this could be something very, very important. Um, so get the taxi drivers. <laughs> And um, yeah, um, we will have our um, one speaker from the Gorillas Workers Collective on the 29th, Zeynep, who will really share their story of migrant union organizing in Berlin. And then we will have another colleague of Daniel and another expert, Yamur, uh, who will represent the Deutsche Wohnen and Co. and Eignen campaign. And yeah, there's been asked uh, questions, Georg, about the invitation for the next workshop, but um, Yamur, will really speak more about also, as I understood, effective campaigning in migrant communities. And I do believe this is the start of something new. Uh, Clemens, you really inspired me today with what is happening in New York City. And maybe you can share the link of um, Pieretta, as I mentioned, as I remember, uh, and her speech in New York. And um, I do believe this is a start of connecting on the European, but also um, national and local level and um, if you have some closing remarks, all panelists, please do that. <laughs> May I shortly? Um, if you want to hear more about New York, the 26th of April, that is now the International Day of Voting Rights for All, we will um, have someone from New York to speak on the situation in New York, and you can hear more of that. So 26th of April, if you mark it in your calendar, and um, we will somehow contact, you can look at our website. Uh, oh, that's difficult. Wir-wählen.org. But I will write it down. So if you're interested, let us know. Thank you. And thank you for the organization. That was really inspiring. And I hope we see us again. We need a big coalition. Here we are. Thank you, Clemens. Daniel saying thank you, everyone. Um, other speakers want to share something? Last hopeful words, maybe. <laughs> other than that, if not, 
Um, ah, yeah, Mohammed from France, as I understood, no? From, yes. Yes, uh, I cannot uh, start uh, the, the video, but um, uh, I was also in another meeting uh, uh, in Paris uh, with Voter Without Border, and uh, we introduced what happened in uh, was happening in, uh, in Germany, the idea of a symbolic uh, vote. It was very interesting uh, uh, meeting and uh, there was, there was uh, Tony uh, Vinal there from uh, uh, the ACID. And uh, I hope we are doing, uh, we are preparing the next campaign for the voting right, for the uh, election, presidential election. And uh, we are, uh, as a collective of uh, Vote who fights for uh, voting rights uh, for all uh, foreigner, foreign resident. We are preparing a, a series of meetings uh, and uh, we will hold uh, the symbolic vote in, uh, for the presidential election, which is a new idea in France. And of course, we will be participating at uh, the April 26 uh, event at uh, with the, the VRAR uh, uh, collect network at uh, and uh, uh, we appreciate I appreciate very much uh, the time I participate in these meetings uh, um, even uh, it was split into 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 two uh, parts and uh, I am looking forward to uh, attend your uh, working shop as I have uh, relatives in uh, living in uh, Warsaw in Poland and uh, some of them moved to Germany. So it will be very, I'm motivated to follow up uh, about it. Thank you. Thank you from France. So all of us not only have the Brits in mind as Lara um, just reminded us, but also the French presidential elections coming up this year and how we can think more transnationally um, as an already very transnational group with a, I do believe, internationalist spirit. And let's reclaim that. And um, I wish you now all a wonderful, wonderful evening and take the spirit and the knowledge with you. We are in touch and um, thank you and goodbye.